Don't tell you. Uh, need a couple of up oh, there we go i think everybody's no, you need to mute are we all me i think we're all muted now thank you dr sarah and good evening everybody it is one chilly night no we're not muted can somebody uh everybody please check your Everybody, there we go. I think we're good. <laughs> Let's try it again. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another week of good nature. Uh, here at Casa Ada, we've been staying warm. I hope you are too. I've got my warm beverage from uh, actually not a tourist trap tonight. This mug is. Uh, from Ding Darling down in Sanibel, uh, Sanibel Island, Florida. But it's a little warmer there than it is here. I've uh, got some candy cane tea tonight. I uh, hope you're comfortable and uh, hope you're ready <clears throat> for uh, an hour of nature news. Um, you can see we've been joined here by a friend, um, a great horned owl. I'm going to hope that uh, it stays where it's supposed to uh, over the next hour. There's, you can see we've got uh, the furry roommates that are pretty interested in it. But anyway, let's go ahead and, uh, and get started here. Um, uh, let me get our screen share going. And well then. All right, let me try that one more time. Screen share. All right, here we go. Okay. No, it's not opening. Boy. Let me try it one more time. Everybody, <laughs> talk amongst yourselves or talk to yourself. Don't unmute. <laughs> uh, there we go. All right, folks, let's get some good nature going here. So um, this past week was uh, a little bit of a milestone at Good Natured World Headquarters. It marked um, the start of our 15th year, uh, meaning I've been writing this column for uh, 14 years in uh, the Kane County Chronicle and the last several years also on Kane County Connects. And um, I, I tell you, it's... Um, it's been pretty fun. Uh, we've covered a lot of nature over the years. I was trying to come up with a topic that um, I thought would be, you know, sort of uh, representative or symbolic of uh, 14 years. You know how, you know, when you get married, your first anniversary is is celebrated with something paper, and then you know. 25 years is silver and 50 years is gold. Well, I looked up and 14 years is ivory. Um, I certainly wasn't gonna go and celebrate anything made out of ivory, but um, ivory billed woodpeckers, as it turns out, are actually quite, uh, type, uh, quite topical right now. Last, let's see, I think this was back in September, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife announced uh, a list of 23 species that it was going to be through the uh, Endangered Species Act was going to be uh, removing uh, from the endangered classification and on into extinction. Um, a lot of freshwater mussels were on that list. Uh, there was a plant. Uh, there were some birds in Hawaii, poor Hawaii, uh, you know, with all the invaders that have come there, a lot of its native species are taking a hint. But 
anyway, the, the ivory-billed woodpecker, out of all these uh, different species that were listed um, uh, for uh, being moved to, to the class of extinction, the ivory-billed woodpecker is by far the most interesting, the most controversial. I shouldn't say the most interesting, they're all interesting, but the most controversial and interesting from the human perspective um, and the number, uh, you know, you go down the line and one person says, yes, they're extinct. And the next guy's going to say, nope, they're not, because here's proof. And this has been going on and on and on. In fact, uh, back in the 1920s, it was thought that the ivory-billed woodpecker was extinct. Uh, so this isn't really uh, anything new, uh, but it is um, uh, up uh the debate is still still raging. Uh, let's take a look at this species. Here's a uh, this is a, a photo uh, from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service of a uh, museum mount um, and a display. I believe this is of a museum in Pittsburgh. Um, this is a large woodpecker. Um, the size estimates uh, put it at about 20 inches in length uh, with a sizable wingspan. Um, the largest woodpecker that we know of uh, in North America is the uh, pileated woodpecker. <laughs> and uh, it is, uh, <laughs> it's funny, uh, Tommy, my, my parrot does not like us talking about extinct birds. I think he's gonna be okay as long as I keep my eye on him here. Well, um, anyway, the uh, the pileated woodpecker is somewhat smaller. It's we describe it as being crow sized, um, and the, uh, so the ivory build was a little bit bigger than that. What we see here, side by side, is the uh, the uh, pileated. It's a male pileated on the right and uh, ivory build on the left. You can see the bill is distinctly dark on the. Uh, uh, pileated. Uh, the crest is a little bit different too. On the, uh, the ivory bill, it's on the back of the head of the male. Um, and on the pileated, uh, the crest goes all the way forward and actually touches the bill uh, on the, uh, the male. He's also got on the malar stripe, which is by the, uh, the bill there, uh, he's got a little bit of red as well. Now, um, a lot of the more recent controversies, because there are uh, videos from the early 2000s, 2006, 2008, showing this bird in flight. And a lot of uh, the discussion centers around what's seen in the video uh, in terms of where the white is on the wings. So here we've got um, a couple of diagrams showing how the uh, pileated, the trailing edge of the wing is dark. And with the ivory belt, there's quite a bit of white on the back part of the wings. Um, there's also been reports of seeing uh, females. The female ivory bill, um, she does have a crest, uh, but it is dark. It is um, not red. This uh, diagram here compares her to the female pileated, which uh, has a red, has a crest, but it's red. Um, a lot of our Female woodpeckers don't have uh, red like this on their heads, but um, she does. Keep in mind, sometimes red can look like black depending on the lighting. So anyway, there's, like I said, there's, there's controversy that has been raging for decades as to whether this bird is still alive or not. Um, Way back, uh, gosh, this goes back probably 75 years or more, Arthur Cleveland Bent in his Life Histories of North American Birds, he describes the ivory bill as a bird of the great moss hung southern swamps where mature timber with its dying uh, branches provides a bounteous food supply of beetle larvae. Well, um, there's a bounteous supply of food. Um, but this is an area that's it's hard to explore. There's a lot of areas, uh, and we're talking about um, the southeastern United States. There's a lot of areas that you're you're poking around in a kayak or a canoe. Um, th there's areas that are, are really kind of inaccessible by humans. Um, this map here, this was uh, drawn by. Uh, 
uh, James Tanner, he wrote a book, which we'll get to in a little bit, pretty comprehensive look at the ivory-billed woodpecker back in the 1940s. Uh, and this was the map uh, that he felt showed the uh, range of the ivory bill. But throughout history, this bird has been uh, a factor, even, um, Oh, uh, let's uh, go down. Where were we here? Let's go back to this slide. There we go. Um, Thomas Jefferson said that the uh, the bird was part of the fauna of Virginia, and uh, James John James Audubon said that the bird was seen as far north as Maryland. There's even reports of the bird being seen in New Jersey in the 1700s. Um, in uh, midden remains in Ohio, they found bones of the ivory-billed woodpecker. And there's written accounts of people hunting ivory-bills in Kentucky in the 1780s. So um, now even the range of this bird is uh, disputed. Uh, and has been for uh, a number of not just decades, but centuries. So um, the big things that have impacted um, the species are, well, they're things that so often we hear about habitat destruction. In this case, it was in the form of logging. A lot of the, uh, the old growth uh, trees in those uh, Cypress and Tupelo swamps. Uh, there was a, a lot of logging going on. In fact, um, one of the areas is known in Louisiana as the, the Singer Tract uh, that was owned by the Singer Sewing Machine Company. It was used for their wooden cabinets. Um, this was also uh, in the 1800s, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, as our country was rapidly expanding. Um, there was a lot of uh, natural resources that were uh, falling being put to use uh, by industry. So logging was one aspect of it. And then uh, these birds, believe it or not, they were hunted uh, for a period of time, even going back to the time of the Native Americans. Uh, the bills and the crests of these birds were used uh, in a lot of ornamentation. And they were also shot as a, uh, a food bird, so a uh, food source. So um, yeah, th these dual impacts uh, really took their toll on this species. Um, this is that book I was referring to earlier. Jim Tanner wrote this book in 1942. And um, the uh, first edition copies, I think, go for somewhere close to $1,000, but it's been reprinted several times. You can still pick it up. Um, I don't know if it's currently in print. I know I've seen it in a lot of used bookstores. A lot. In fact, I ordered a copy from uh, a, a used book website. So I got so uh, infatuated by this bird that um, I, I want to read as much as I can about it. Um, it it's, um, it's a bird that, for, as I was saying, for every person who says it's extinct, there's another person who says it's not. Um, this is an article, uh, this is on the, uh, the Audubon website, it dates to 2017, so five years ago, um, this was still being discussed, this was long before the Fish and Wildlife uh, proposed the species uh, for extinction, but um, this gives you a, a sense of the sort of evidence <laughs> Uh, being shared as he really doesn't like us talking about extinction, extinct birds anyway. Um, so um, on the left is uh, some 2006 footage, the dark, um, there's a, a, a bit of uh, darker image um, about on the mid, uh, middle left of the video. That's the ivory bill. You can watch, there's actually motion. If you go to the website, you can um, see the bird flit from one side of that tree to the other. On the right, uh, it compares it to a, a similar motion um, uh, of a, a pileated woodpecker going from one side of a tree to another. Um, down a little bit farther in the article, this is some footage that is of an ivory bill entering its uh, next uh, nest cavity uh, on the left-hand side, and then 
um, that compares it to more recent footage um, taken on the Pearl River, which is on the border of Mississippi and Louisiana. Um, I didn't want to run afoul of any copyrights, so I didn't um, copy the whole video, but you can view them on the Audubon website. Uh, I tell you, every time I looked at these videos, I was trying to see uh, what the experts uh, were interpreting. In fact, there's YouTube videos too that you can watch where the experts, um, uh, gentlemen, uh, like um, people from uh, the uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, uh, Michael Collins, who took some of this video, he will go frame by frame of what he saw. But then you've got people like David Allen Sibley, who has authored and um, drawn and painted uh, birds in his own field guides, is very familiar with um, plumage and field marks. Uh, he says, no, what we're seeing are uh, pileated woodpeckers. They are not, um, not ivory bills. So Sibley says no, Collins says yes on and on and on it goes. But when you look at these videos, doesn't it kind of make you think of this, you know, kind of blurry, kind of grainy, kind of uh, somewhat mythical? Um, I think this is uh, a debate, uh, regardless of what fish and wildlife rules, I think this debate is going to rage for some time to come. Um, so the, the way the Endangered Species Act works is it, it's a measure uh, for, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife to act upon um, once a, once a species is on that list, it's it's not meant to stay there forever. It either um, resources are are you know, given towards recovery of that species, and if the uh, efforts are successful, it's uh, removed um, via the. Uh, uh, a proposed rule on the Endangered Species Act, it will be removed uh, and that status will be taken away or it will be given the status of extinct. And that's all done through the Federal Register and uh, proposed rules, which are always then followed by a comment period. Well, when this proposal was made back in, again, like I said, I think it was September, uh, the comments, uh, most of the other species, like those mussels and those poor birds in Hawaii, um, there wasn't a lot of comment, but the ivory-billed woodpecker's inclusion um, in this proposed rule generated so many comments uh, and so much discussion that the comment period has been extended until February 10th. So um, yes, you too, if you feel as though you've got something that might uh, sway the decision one way or another, you can go to the Federal Register website and you can register your comments there. So chance to get involved if you're so inclined. Um, if you want to see an ivory-billed woodpecker, you do have this option. Um, this is uh, a license plate that is offered by the state of Arkansas. And um, those of you who drive around and look at license plates, here's your chance. That shows the, um, the male ivory-billed woodpecker driving around in one of the states where it is alleged to still be surviving. Anyway, um, let's go on. <laughs> topic, um, oddly enough, sort of related to birds. <laughs> um, this is uh, the, you know what, he's going to come and sit on my shoulder. Uh, dinosaurs in Illinois. This was a topic that, you know, it comes up from time to time. Uh, Lexi, pretty much any time we do uh, a school group with kids and we're talking about the history of Illinois, they always want to know about dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are such a, an iconic creature. Every kid goes through a dinosaur fascination stage. And, um, you know, we, we try to uh, hold their interest by talking about the days when um, there was an inland sea, when our uh, what's now North America was closer to the equator and uh, things were very warm. We had this warm inland sea with all these fascinating uh, shelled sea creatures. That's, uh, that we sometimes show them fossils. Uh, this is a, a fossil, actually you can go down and see it. If you are local, you can go down to uh, Fabian Forest Preserve. There's 
in uh, Ordovician fossil right there in the bedrock at uh, Fabian East in the Fox River uh, on the shelf of bedrock down there. Um, yeah, if that's not good enough, we can also talk a little bit about the Carboniferous period. This is the time when, um, again, that our country was still very, very warm down close to the equator. And uh, this is when the, the giant dragonflies came to be. This is where we get our coal uh, from the, uh, the Carboniferous period. Um, but, you know, dinosaurs, they're just not found in Illinois. We just don't find the remains um, that uh, other states, particularly in the West have. Although there's even been dinosaur remains found in Missouri. Uh, the, uh, the geologists and uh, paleontologists will tell us that the, uh, the conditions in Illinois just weren't right for the preservation of these fossils. They eroded away the um, harsh winds and other types of weather. Uh, we also had our glacial periods where uh, lots of uh, material in the form of gravel and sand and rocks were um, dumped down, uh, brought down you know, from uh, Michigan and uh, Canada, places north, dumped all over Illinois. So anyway, we just don't find dinosaur fossils here. So why am I bringing this up? Well, um, there's this uh, fellow, uh, and I, I have to say I'm not a, I'm not a TikToker, but um, this guy goes by the, the name of Murph, Murph Murphy. He lives down in Sherman, Illinois, and he has um, a TikTok account where he, he played a joke on people. He talked about um, a farmer having excavated a... Um, a big hole for a gas tank on his property and um, he cited experts coming from California. I think he threw around the term archaeologist rather than paleontologist, but you know, he just uh, played this thing for four or five minutes as he's driving around his hometown of Sherman, Illinois. And he said that this, this uh, farmer found a tibia tibia as in the bone in your leg, T-I-B-I-A. There was a tibia found that was just enormous and these experts were gonna come in and they were gonna um, you know, check it out. They were gonna try and identify it. They, he ended the video by saying, it will be the biggest shindig our little town has ever had. And it was supposed to be a joke, a shindig, you know, because your tibia is your shin. Well, this thing, he ends up getting, uh, this video goes viral. And uh, the poor people down at uh, the Illinois State Geologic Survey, the Illinois Natural History Survey, they start getting all these calls about dinosaurs in Illinois because they found them down in Sherman. The guy on TikTok said so. So, um, and there's a, a lot more you can read about it online. Um, the, the Tribune covered it and uh, the Pantograph down in Southern Illinois also ran uh, in fact, I think it was the same article by the Tribune reporter. But uh, funny little thing that um, any third grader will tell you, no, there's no dinosaurs in Illinois. But if you go on TikTok, you can find out that they really, uh, according to Murph anyway, uh, they really did exist, um, at least in his own uh, honey mind. <laughs> the biggest shindig his little town ever saw. All right, you know, let's uh, let's leave that alone and go on to our next news item, which came in the form of a text message. Um, this came in uh, yesterday it was from my friend Amber, and she wanted to know uh, if I was any good at identifying feline tracks. This was down near her grandmother's house in uh, Grant County, Indiana, and um, she said that. They have uh, confirmed sightings of cougars only twice in history, but the FedEx guy says he's seen one for sure. Um, they also uh, said they had never seen these sorts of tracks before, and her cousin Bud said that they're huge. So she, of course, accompanied the text message uh, with a photograph. So there, I'm guessing that's cousin Bud's hand, and there's the track. 
So, um, big paw prints in the mud, uh, unfamiliar tracks caused some stir uh, down in, in Grant County. And uh, so I looked at them and my first impression was not that of a cat. Now, I think we've, we've talked about this before, but let's go over it again. Um, here we've got diagrams, uh, courtesy of the Illinois DNR, that show on the left what a cat track looks like, and on the right, uh, what you would expect to see from a large dog. Um, this particular diagram focuses on um, whether there's claws or not, um, the shape of the toes, the, uh, the way the toes hit the ground, um, on a cougar or a cat, you'll always see that uh, one toe, kind of the equivalent of our fingers, <laughs> uh, leading out in front of the other ones, whereas um, the toes on a dog are going to be more evenly placed. Um, the heel on the cat track is quite large. Um, if it's a really clear print, you're going to be able to see three lobes at the back of it. That doesn't often happen. Um, what I like to go by is just the shape of those, um, uh, where the, the negative space, the space in between the toes and the heel fall, and um, uh, how you can draw an X between them. So let's go back, I'll do that again. So um, there's the uh, diagram on the right shows the dog tracks, and then um, you can, draw an X between the toes and the heel. And um, you can't do that on the cougar. You'll hit the heel pad before you've complete the line of your X. So um, we looked at cousin Bud's hand again, and I drew an X through there. And I said, you know, I don't think, I don't think it's a cougar. I think it's, it's a dog. I think it's a canine anyway. So she said, well, <laughs> wolf or a coyote? Oh, can, we, can we mute ourselves, folks? Um, and so I sent her this diagram. And you can see on here, the type's a little bit small, but uh, five inches is um, uh, the length of a wolf track. And um, Cousin Bud, I'm sure, is a, a big guy and he's got a big hand, but, but those tracks aren't five inches long. Um, whoa. <laughs> Can we mute folks? Um, so uh, Amber then responded, so maybe a coyote. Well, actually it's too, uh, they're too big for a coyote. Um, so smaller than a wolf, bigger than a coyote. That leaves us with uh, the neighborhood hound. So, you know, might've been a, maybe a husky, maybe a Malamute, maybe a German shepherd, um, but that, and the, the talk of cougars in Grant County, although Cousin Bud and the FedEx guy might still dispute us on that. But anyway, just a fun little tracking exercise uh, came across the desk this week. Now let's move on to our next topic. So this one came to me literally uh, as I was in the kitchen preparing breakfast the other day. I saw a running crab. Um, not this kind of running crab though. It was, this is um, Philodromidae, which is the family of running crab spiders. This is a little spider hanging out in my kitchen. Um, it has been here now for over a week, um, hanging out kind of above, um, above the refrigerator and um, actually today migrated over to near the uh, Light. So I know he's still alive, still moving around. Um, the thing with running crabs is there's something about the shape of them that causes people to think that uh, they're looking at something dangerous, maybe a uh, even a, a brown recluse. Um, here's an up close view of um, the running crab. The thing with that, and you can see how small it is. I got the the Blistex up there um, to take a photo. It's 
not even a, a quarter of an, uh, a half an inch long. It was a very, very small spider. I would say the body is more like a quarter of an inch. Um, running crabs are, they're a pretty common uh, family of spiders. There's a lot of different species, but um, the way we can tell it's a running crab, is we look at the, the uh, shape of the legs and the length of the legs. So um, as we look at this spider, we can see, that it is um, a pair of legs. Could we mute again, folks, please? Everybody check your mutes. Um, the, uh, the second pair of legs is longer than the first. Um, the, uh, uh, there's two claws, so that, that two claws, I, I did not look at its little tiny feet to see if it has two claws um, on each foot. But what that means is that it's probably not going to be able to walk on uh, smooth surfaces. Spiders have different numbers of claws on their feet. Some have two, some have three. The, uh, if they have more claws, they're able to grip better. And um, you know, some can run up the, uh, the porcelain in your sink or your tub, and some cannot. Some get trapped in there. This would be one that wouldn't be able to uh, climb on a smooth surface. It can grip the wall OK, you know, painted uh, drywall or plaster, no problem. But um, window glass or, or porcelain, it would uh, not be able to hold on. So um, it's also, so the eight eyes, that's important if you are thinking, uh, and again, brown recluse spiders, we've talked about these guys a couple of times in the past. We don't typically see them here. We're a little too far north for brown recluse spider um, to, to be found in this area. But uh, they are a species that has um, only six eyes. Might have to get kind of close, maybe dangerously close um, to see them. Uh, but um, the crab spider will have eight eyes. So um, just a kind of a fun little thing. Uh, and it's going to be a great, it was going to be a great segue, but I think, um, <laughs> I think tech support puppy took our next uh, item away. Uh, Laura, this was going to be my chance to show everyone the uh, the Christmas spider that you gave me. Maybe you guys are familiar with the legend of the Christmas spider. Uh, well, Laura, bless your heart. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. No, I, I had it out. I was gonna I was gonna uh, hold it up right in front of the camera for everybody to see, and doggone it, it's gone um, <laughs> between the bird and the dog. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe um, next year. <laughs> I'm sure it's around somewhere. But you, know, you know, tech support puppy is gone. <laughs> and so is the spider. <laughs> I thought he was sniffing uh, our next item here, but um, it's it's the it's the cutest thing, guys. I um, hopefully you know I'll, I'll be able to find it for next week, but the, the legend, the Christmas spider talks about how um, uh, it was a Christmas Eve and the, the house was decorated and all the spiders had to be shooed away because the Christ child was going to be coming. And um, you know, the, the people decorated their tree, but the spiders who had been shooed away wanted to come in and see the beautiful tree and the beautiful Christ child. And they, they came into the room but as they ran around looking at the tree, they were leaving web behind. Is that how the legend goes? Laura? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so they're leaving web behind as they uh, were looking at the at the tree, and then um, uh, uh, the Christ Child came and um, didn't kill the spiders because they are God's creatures too. And um, but he touched the the web and they turned to gold, and that's why we have tinsel on our trees, and that's why we hang the lovely spider ornaments <laughs> oh laura <laughs> again next week i've been making this for weeks now but i very much appreciate the gift let me stop the screen share here 
Um, but yeah, it's it's a cool thing and uh, something that uh, I hope to share with the group next week. Um, let's see. So we've got one more thing here. Um, we've had a lot of calls from people lately about uh, two two aspects of this creature here. Um, this is a. Uh, well, I wonder if Tom. I wonder if that's why he's so upset. Let's see. Is there a intermingling of the species here? <laughs> I wonder, because, you know, uh, so Tom is the creature on my back. <laughs> it's, uh, it's my, my uh, blue and gold macaw, Tommy. And um, he's kind of famous for overreacting. He, uh, a few years ago, a red-tailed hawk had uh, swooped across the backyard and he freaked out so bad. He was squawking. He fell off his perch. He, his feathers were all ruffled. He just couldn't settle down because he'd seen the uh, outline, the uh, silhouette of a predator. And uh, these guys um, are not birds of prey. They happen to be prey sometimes. So um, I wonder if that's one of the reasons why he was so upset tonight. Anyway, um, getting back to the, the uh, item at hand here. So, so people have been asking me, you know, what's up with great horned owls? They've been hearing them a lot. Uh, like the the, uh, the calls and emails have been one of two things: either I've been hearing them a lot, why? Or I was hearing them a lot and now I'm not. And what happened? So, um, what's going on is we are in the midst of great horned owl uh, breeding season. They are the first birds in our area, uh, most areas, in fact, the two. Um, mate and lay eggs and raise their young. Yes, they're doing that even now tonight when it is uh, below zero out. Um, it's something, it's a behavior that um, developed, you know, probably thousands of years ago, but it helps them uh, take advantage of um, a time when most other birds are not in reproductive mode. Um, they, uh, will go ahead and, and set up their uh, their breeding territory. They tend to hang out in the same area year after year. They, the uh, pair does stay together year after year. And um, they will uh, choose a site. They will also um, choose uh, a nest. They do not build their own nest. Now, they might take over a red-tailed hawk nest, which uh, hawks aren't breeding at this time of year. We've seen them use uh, great blue heron nests because the herons aren't breeding at this time of year. Uh, they might take over a squirrel nest, whether or not the squirrel is still in it. Uh, and then they also will go into snags or broken off uh, trees, uh, particularly the big oak trees that we have around here. So this is going on right now. Like if you're still hearing uh, pairs hooting back and forth in uh, great horns, they, uh, if you listen closely, you can tell uh, if it's the male or the female that's uh, hooting. The, uh, the female, she's the larger of the pair. Um, she needs that bulk to uh, keep the eggs warm and uh, protect her young in the nest. Uh, so she's bigger, but her voice is higher, and she'll be doing sort of a hoo -hoo 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 -hoo. whereas the male is a, a smaller bird, but he's got a deeper voice, and he has more of a hoo -hoo 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 -hoo. so you know a few um, notes of difference in the pitch of their calls. Uh, so they, they talk back and forth. Uh, one, they're letting other birds know that they're in the area. If there's any other uh, owls looking to set up a territory, if they hear that hoop, they know that they're going to have to move on and uh, find someplace else. Um, that will continue until she has uh, started to uh, lay her eggs. And once uh, the uh, egg eggs are uh, in the nest and, and she's incubating them, then the birds um, go quiet because they don't want to, uh, they want to attract a lot of attention to uh, what they're up to. They don't want to invite somebody, well, I don't know what animal would be silly enough to want to take on a great horned owl, but they, they want to go about, uh, you know, they want to make sure that they're not drawing a lot of attention to where their nest is while those eggs are uh, being incubated and the young are quite small. So um, I wanted to also just point out a few features 
of these magnificent birds. So this is a this is a male. Um, I don't know. I <laughs> my hands are full. <laughs> I can't get my lip balm out. <laughs> but um, this is a male great horn owl. Female would be maybe a third or more larger than him, so taller, broader. Um, they have they're named for the the feather tufts that are on top of their head. Uh, you'll often hear those tufts referred to as the ear tufts, but um, they're not ears. The ears on the owl are right here, just as our ears are on the side of our heads, the uh, owl's ears are on the side of its head. Uh, you might have heard that owl's ears are asymmetrical. You know, that kind of varies, it varies actually quite a bit with species. The, the great horned owl's ears are pretty much straight across from each other. Uh, the great horned owl is, um, it can be active at night. Uh, it does a lot of its hunting though during the crepuscular hours, which are dawn and dusk. Uh, some of our truly nocturnal hunting owls, like our barn owls, that's where we'll see the uh, ear placement uh, being asymmetrical. One ear will be higher than the other. That allows them um, to uh, find with, with incredible accuracy um, their prey even in the dark because they can sense um, where the prey is by when, when the sound hits one ear or the other. Um, they can sense it's within, um, oh, it's like millions of a second when the sound hits the ear and they can determine the direction of the sound from that. So um, regardless of the ear placement, they do have really, really good hearing. Uh, all owls are known for that. Something that helps them with their uh, uh, hunting prowess is their ability to fly without making any noise. The leading edge of their wings has, uh, it almost looks like a, a fine tooth comb, very uh, small serrated feather uh, edge on the front of uh, the two, uh, of the front of the wings. So that cuts through the air and it makes, um, you don't really, in fact, um, when an uh, owl is flying, if somebody tells you, oh, you know what, I heard all this flapping, you know, and then I saw an owl land. Um, that you, you don't ever hear owls flapping. They, uh, besides that adaptation on the wing, um, they also um, have just layers. Yeah, he really doesn't like this bird. Um, their feathers, their body's like a big muffler. The feathers uh, help silence the sound, any sound that they might be making. And um, they can swoop in it. That allows them, A, the element of surprise, and B, the, um, the ability to still hear their prey um, when they're uh, flying towards it. You know, um, we've got a bit of snow on the ground finally here in Northern Illinois. Um, I was out you know, removing some of that snow the other day and I noticed, I think we've got, I don't know, maybe four or five inches on the ground now, but I noticed that there were a lot of raised patterns in the snow. Uh, that told me that there is activity underneath. Uh, might have been uh, voles or shrews. Probably one animal will make the tunnel and then other animals will follow it. And I, I know I've got shrews and I'm pretty sure there's some, some voles and mice around too. Um, but those raised tunnels underneath the snow, those are a clue, uh, something the owl uses its um, pretty sharp eyes to detect. To, so they can see where their prey might be under the snow, and then they can hear where it's moving at. So that uh, one-two punch is pretty effective in terms of uh, finding and uh, hunting and finding the prey. Um, when it comes to eating the prey, yeah, yeah, they gulp and they swallow. Uh, the uh, the owl is not known for uh, being too discriminating. In fact, this is one of the only animals we know of that will actually uh, hunt down and, and feed on skunk. Um, their sense of taste, uh, when people have looked into the, the lobes of the brain of the great horned owl, um, there's not a lot of olfactory 
action going on in the brain. So the thinking is they don't really smell uh, the sense of smell and they don't have much of a sense of taste either. Um, we actually have a skull at Hickory Knolls that has um, a couple of holes in it that match almost perfectly the uh, shape and size of the uh, the uh, bill, uh, the beak, and the uh, the talons of the great horned owl. So um, I had this out for a program, and I thought I'd uh, take advantage while it was still here to share it with you uh, and freak my bird out at the same time. Tell you what, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to you. It looks like we've got some chats here. Let's see what uh, you all have to say tonight. Um, okay. Oh, it's, oh my goodness. Uh, Greg, are you down in Fort Myers? It's, that's a chilly 56. You might need to turn the, turn the fire on down there. <laughs> um, let's see, Jerry, you're rooting for the ivory build. Um, not terribly hopeful. Um, yeah, they, um, like to conceive. So the thing, what, what happens when, when a bird is listed as extinct, that means that any effort to restore habitat or uh, conserve the habitat where it was once found, um, th that effort is directed elsewhere. Because it's why, you know, why keep um, trying to preserve something that's not there anymore. But if you keep that, um, uh, if, if it stays on the endangered species list, then um, there might still be resources directed towards uh, finding it and conserving the habitat that it lives in. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I, I, I want to have one found, but I, I, it's an area I'm completely unfamiliar with. So I, um, I can't weigh in with any other sort of, uh, you know, expertise other than that, you know, I just like to cheer for the underdog. So as for, uh, and you notice this whole time I've been saying pileated. Um, when I first learned about this large woodpecker, I was down south. That's how everybody down there pronounces it. Up here, you'll probably hear the term pileated. And uh, when I got home from that trip, I had to make a decision. Was I going to learn, you know, keep with how I first learned it? Or was I going to follow uh, everybody around here? Um, I decided I like pie better than I like pills. So I stuck with pileated. But um, yeah, Jerry, we are seeing more uh, in this area than we did, say, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, they... Um, I don't know if it was uh, emerald ash borer. Uh, it seems like just in general, our woodpeckers seem to be doing better. That's strictly anecdotal. I don't have any data to back it up, but um, we are seeing signs of pileated woodpeckers. In fact, they actually excavated a, a nest cavity here in St. Charles a couple of years ago. Um, I don't know if they raised any young there, um, but we, we do see signs. Um, Tekka with the Woods Forest Preserve has some uh, pretty uh, noticeable signs of excavations of pileys. They make a very distinctive uh, sort of whether they're they're feeding or whether they're uh, they, their nest uh, cavity hole is, is pretty good size around. When they're feeding, they make a, a very distinctive um, rectangular um, the holes in in uh, trees. Um, again, they're looking for uh, beetle larvae and, and things like that. Um, uh, ants too. I think they eat a lot of ants. Um, so yeah, come on out. Maybe we can find one. It'll be kind of like chasing down the sour gums though. <laughs> um, so Greg and Kelly, is the concern with uh, moving the ivory billed woodpecker to the extinct list uh, that, yes, any of the funds that were set to go. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much what it is. And there are uh, a lot of people who say they're still seeing them and they feel as though their documentation isn't being accepted because uh, they're not a Sibley, um, they, they don't have a field guide. Um, but they, there's, you know, again, it's just, it's back and forth and back and forth. And um, for every expert that will go through those videos and point out the field mark saying, yes, it is an ivory bill. There's another expert who will go through it and deny everyone and say, no, it's not, this isn't right. This isn't correct. So yeah, 
it does as often so often these things do comes down to a matter of funding uh, all right got a couple more here um Yes, that there is. I, I forget the name of that book, Michelle, but uh, um, how the spiders decorated uh, the tree um, because they couldn't afford. It. I, I've I've read that. Um, I want to say that's in our uh, little free library over at Hickory Knolls. That is a great story. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, you know, I fuss with my appearance, and um, you know, all my work is is for not tonight because this uh, bird and I. It didn't even occur to me that uh, he might be upset by the owl, um, and it, it might not be. He might just be being himself. He's a pretty animated guy, but um, I will have to redo my locks again when we're done. <laughs> um, yeah, you're right, Laura. We did not have dying. Well, I'm. Everybody says that oh, the, the uh, conditions were such that we did have dinosaurs here. The remains are just not people. But yeah, woolly mammoths as well as uh, mastodon remains have been found in this area. Uh, so um, there's a mammoth. Uh, most of what we found, not we, but have been found in this area have been mastodons. Um, but the um, uh, the over at McGee Marsh, which is by um, um, Blackwell Forest Preserve, they did find a woolly mammoth over there. Um, all right, so uh, we've got some more info. Uh, a Christmas Spider's Miracle and Cobweb Christmas. Um, and um, Yes, that's a good point too, Jerry. Um, so yeah, so uh, yellow belly sap suckers do have that distinctive uh, holes in the line sort of uh, foraging that they do. Um, boy, I don't know though, for downies and red bellies, uh, hairy woodpeckers, you have to be pretty good to be able to discern their signs. But it's a new year, maybe that's a goal we could set. <laughs> um, uh, let's see, Set. looks like we're down to the bottom of the chats, does, uh, oh, Legend of the Christmas Spider. All right, so um, I got to go upstairs and find out what, uh, what tech support puppy has done uh, with my Christmas spider, um, and I'll see if I can uh, get that out to us next week, because it really is beautiful. And again, Laura, I thank you so much for it. Um, I think uh to set the end does anybody else have anything for the group if not um sure appreciate your time this evening putting up with um the feathery friend <laughs> um the feathery roommate was not being a, a good team player tonight um but he got some camera time and i think that made him happy uh <laughs> Stay warm, stay safe, everybody. Uh, hope to see you back again next week. Have a great, good nature rest of your week. Take care. Thanks, Pam. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Long, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Good night, Pam. Bye, G. So long.